Hey there, and welcome back to another video. This is Thousand Ant, and I'm Matt Shell. And in this video, I want to talk about a hot topic uh, in our industry, which is NFTs or non fungible tokens. I'm going to talk about how I see them fitting into the technological landscape, how I think they affect game developers, both positively and negatively, and kind of give you some food for thought to become more educated yourself. Let's get started. First of all, I think I, I want to give a kind of a disclaimer, which is that I understand that this is a topic that generates extreme heat on both sides. The people who are supportive of NFTs have a kind of a cult-like devotion kind of created by their financial incentives, right? They want to see the number go up. On the other side, uh, there is this very, very strong and unfortunately often poorly informed backlash against them, right? And so what I want to do is to talk about what I see as some of the worst problems with them as they relate to games and what I see as some of the potential opportunities of ways that they could be useful in the game space legitimately and so that we can kind of have a slightly more informed perspective about them, right, rather than just kind of like reflexively shouting at each other from the two sides of the issue. This is an issue, if you know me and what I talk about here about games and business, is very interesting to me, right? Like it's, it connects money, culture, technology, art, software. I mean, this is right in my uh, wheelhouse. So as this topic started to pick up steam, I kind of jumped in and started to research and pay attention and to try to understand it more deeply. And I wanted to kind of wait to talk about it on the channel until I felt like I had a reasonably informed perspective. If you want a really good, long, but really well researched and well thought out argument against NFTs, there is a two hour YouTube documentary called Line Go Up by, or Line Goes Up by Folding Ideas, which is really accurate and informed and presents the kind of argument against cryptocurrency and NFTs in great terms. It's, it's really good. It's really worth watching and interesting. And if you're somebody who's already kind of biased against NFTs and crypto, uh, you will be like, yeah, that's right. And you'll get some great arguments to dunk on your friends. On the other side of the issue, honestly, I wouldn't, I don't want to really take the role of arguing in favor of NFTs because while I think they're interesting and worth understanding, I don't think I'm the best person to kind of defend them, but I will share some things that I think could be interesting and legitimately useful. Because this is a game development focused channel, let's talk about some of the pro NFT game arguments that are wrong. And I think the first of these, honestly, this doesn't need a lot of explaining to game developers, but there's a bunch of NFT people who have gone around saying, hey, you're going to be able to own your items and skins and in-game database entries and take them from one game to another. And now if you've got a really good gun in Fortnite, you can take it over to Call of Duty, right? If you're a game developer, I don't need to explain to you why this is a technically either impossible or very difficult. Economically doesn't make sense, right? Because why would I want to build art assets to support a Fortnite gun in my Call of Duty game, right? It's just technically kind of a incoherent gibberish. Where it comes from is interesting that I think, you know, gamers and players have this feeling of an adversarial relationship with the people who make and run games. I think it comes out of the history of microtransactions where we've been asking players to pay money for skins, which that which is not kind of framed as, hey, donate some money to support our game and keep our game going and good and fun and, and reducing bugs. And instead it's like, hey, buy this item that you own. But the players are rightly being like, well, do I own it though? Because it's in your database. And if you turn the game off, then I'm, kind, I'm, I'm out of luck, right? And so it kind of goes to this thing of be like, no, 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 I could own it because it's in an outside blockchain based database. And now I really own it. Nobody can take it away from me. Right, but what that fails to recognize is, yeah, you might own that token, that entry in the database, right, which is really just a blob of JSON data, but unless there is somebody willing to render it and build a game that accepts it, 
it's, it's not valuable. And that I think is a real misunderstanding. A lot of people have run around telling gamers that this is gonna be great and it's not, right? This is not real. It's a bad idea, and I wish people would stop saying that this is gonna happen, because it's not. I think there's a lot of bad actors, right, who are kind of selling this idea, and it's, it's nonsense. The second bad idea is the idea of play to earn. The biggest example of this is a game called Axie Infinity, which is a kind of a Pokemon-like card-based battling game. There are three currencies. There's a, there's a governance token, which allows people to vote on the, the status of the game. There's a, an NFT, which are basically the, the Pokemon. And then there's this SLP token, which is basically what is used to pay the people who are playing. It's basically a pyramid scheme, unfortunately, because it relies on new players coming in and subsidizing the economy and buying the things generated by previous players in order to preserve their value. What's missing is what we had way back in the day in World of Warcraft when the whole gold farming business got going, even though it was against the terms of service of Blizzard, people figured out, hey, there are players who have more money than time, right? And they might want to pay somebody to level a character up to the level cap so that they can be in, have a priest character in this dungeon instead of the warrior character that they leveled up, right? And there was no easy way to do that within the rules of the game, but you could pay somebody, usually somebody living in China or a low cost of living part of the world, and they would, you would basically pay them to play the game for you and then hand over the character and you would give them some real US dollars money, right? And so people kind of saw that and they were like, well, people are willing to spend money for this. And interestingly, a bunch of the early Bitcoin people came out of the like gold farming industry and stuff. There's some interesting weird connections there. But the, the fundamental misunderstanding there is that there was a, first of all, it was against terms of service, which kind of applied pressure to keep it rare and keep it small. But what, what there was in World of Warcraft were millions of people who were playing the game just for fun. The game was not fundamentally about earning money. And so if I was willing to spend some money to kind of increase the amount of fun I could have in the game, that was because I was primarily playing the game to have fun, not playing the game to make a living, right? What these play to earn games are creating are these kind of virtualized job simulations, right? Where it's literally just a job. Your job is to play this game. You're definitely not doing it for fun. And what that means is that the behavior of the players is really different. They're not gonna buy skins or cosmetic items or anything like that because they don't care. All they care about is maximizing the real money output of the work not play that they're doing in the simulation. And so it's a fundamental misunderstanding of why people play games. And I think it's it's gonna crash and a lot of people are gonna be uh, economically harmed by it, which, which makes it a bad thing. I think that what it, it fundamentally misunderstands is kind of the idea of the magic circle, right? The reason people play games inside the magic circle is because it doesn't matter. If I die in a game, I might be upset or disappointed, but it's not gonna cause me to be unable to pay my rent. And that's the whole point. That's why I work all day doing things on a screen and then go do things on a screen that are imaginary problems, right? I'm solving imaginary problems and that's fun because it's low stakes and relaxing. Once you put real money into it, it's a job, right? Just the way of being an esports player is a job. Lars Doucet has written a really good long Twitter thread and report actually about the economy of Axie Infinity, which spells out all these problems and I think is really credible and, uh, and it's worth reading and I'll put a, a link in the description below. So those are two of the most egregious and wrong and bad things that are happening with crypto and gaming. Um, and I think as game developers, we should speak out against them and be like, hey, this is bad. We know this is bad. We saw Diablo 3 tried to do a real money auction house and it was a disaster. Uh, they had to stop it and cancel it. That's all documented from 13 years ago. You know, as people who know about this stuff, we should tell these new entrants to the space, hey, don't do that, that's bad, right? not cyber bully them or harass them, but just say, hey, we in, in our industry, we know about this and don't do that. It's not, it doesn't work, which Lars is doing a great job of and, and Dan Cook has also done a great job of. One thing to speak out and say, these are bad ideas. I don't like to see the kind of harassment and cyber bullying kind of stuff that's going on on Twitter. Now, what are some potentially useful aspects of this technology for game developers? I have two. 
One is what we've seen with NBA Top Shot. NBA Top Shot is basically a way to speculate on and play collectible value games with highlights from NBA basketball game clips. The important thing about this is it doesn't violate the magic circle, right? It doesn't enter into the game and say, oh, Steph Curry got plus one, you know, scoring basket score uh, because people bought these NFTs, right? It's instead, it's just like, hey, we like watching the game for fun. And now we want to buy a digital collectible of this great moment in a game. And we want to own it because we like collecting things. We know that collectibles are a thing, right? The process of collecting collectibles is kind of analogous to the World of Warcraft thing where people buy collectibles just to have them and because they like them. And then some people treat it as a speculative market. And that's why there's a market, right? That I'm buying these baseball cards or these NBA Top Shot highlights because I want to make money. But there is actually a buyer on the other side. It's like, no, 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 I just think it's cool to own a Michael Jordan basketball card. And I like collecting them and it's fun. And I like looking for the ones I want and buying them and whatever. And I think that's legitimate and fine, right? And I think there's a real question fundamentally about how do you feel about speculation and people kind of turning things like collectibles into something that's kind of like a stock, right? Is that good? Should that be allowed? Are we against it, right? I, I'm sure that a lot of the collectors in the collectible markets would be like, no, everybody should just buy them because they like them and just hold on to them and not sell them, right? But then they're turning around and buying rare things. So they're kind of providing the buyer side of that market, which, you know, you create a market and then people are gonna try to min max and optimize and make money. And, and I don't think that's inherently a bad thing, but I get if you're kind of, hard to the left, you might be like, all markets are bad, this shouldn't be allowed, Wh whatever you're, you know, I, I won't make up arguments that I don't believe in, but I think that there's a case where that's legitimate and good, and I think that could spread out into esports, into all kinds of categories where we're creating artifacts based on, you know, streamers, influencers, esports players, create a new kind of digital collectible. Importantly for Top Shot, Top Shot is, uh, it's on the Flow blockchain, which is actually pretty centralized. It's not even, they could probably do it with a centralized database as opposed to a blockchain. So it's not really a great argument for blockchain technology necessarily, but it is an argument for digital collectibles. And I think it's, I think it could be a thing that's, that's fine and exists and maybe creates a revenue stream for both speculators and potentially players and uh, developers, right? And I think this is, brings me to the second point, which I think is a genuine new piece of technology that could be valuable and useful for many actors in the games industry, which is the idea of on-chain royalties. And this is something where you do need a blockchain or a really big uh, centralized database that everybody agrees to participate in, but I think probably that wouldn't happen, which is that when you're using a smart contract, a token, right, you can encode behavior into the asset, right? If you're working on a blockchain like Ethereum, uh, each token is a little program, usually very small, right, with a blob of JSON inside, which might contain a link to an image or a video file, and also some functions that you can call on the contract and say, hey, transfer this or write to it, change the metadata, or transmit royalties to persons X, Y, and Z, right? And the reason that it can do this is because it's a program that runs inside a money network. This is kind of what is new about, let's take Ethereum for an example, where we now have software that has kind of direct access to money, right? We don't have to go to PayPal, we don't have to go through a payment gateway or Stripe or whatever. Instead, we can just say, hey, no, just send 0.1 Ethereum to the developer of this original game because this asset got transferred from one person to another. In the case of our kind of top shot highlight example, we could say, hey, when we create a highlight, we encode a 1% royalty for the player, a 1% royalty for the game developer or the NBA, a 1% royalty for the platform creator or, the, or maybe the seller. And then those royalties are accounted automatically, right? They just happen. We don't have to wait to reach a payout threshold. We don't have to wait for Steam to decide that they wanna pay us or whoever to decide that they wanna send a check. The money just is transferred by the contract, right? I think that's interesting and good. You know, I think that could be a thing that could really help a lot of 
a lot of different kinds of creators and developers, which brings us to another idea that's kind of connected to this, which is the idea of a decentralized Steam. Steam is a kind of a benevolent dictator in the market. I think they're probably more good than bad, but if you have ever kind of seen your Steam sales go up and down like this because of changes in the Steam algorithm, you understand what it's like to live in a platform that you don't own or control. Steam can unilaterally change the algorithm that affects how people make a living. And so you are basically living inside the walls of their castle and they are king. When you put things out onto a blockchain, you know, the great virtue that's argued almost, you know, sometimes a little bit cultishly by the proponents of blockchain is decentralization. The control of the network is spread out between many different actors, the nodes or validators of the network. I'm not gonna give a whole technical explanation of how blockchains work, you can find that elsewhere. But basically, it's a distributed network. I think for a familiar example, thinking about it as a kind of a bit torrent of money is a pretty good way to think about it. If you're somebody who's used BitTorrent, now it's a few years old, but BitTorrent, a BitTorrent of money is a, a pretty good way to think about it. It's hard to shut down, it's hard to attack, and it's not owned by any one person. It's owned, or, or entity, it's owned by all the participants in the network. In the case of a decentralized Steam, what we could see is when you buy a game from me, I give you a token which entitles you to download the game and when you're done playing it, to resell it, right? So you, I could say, hey, you buy my game for $10, you play it, and then when you're done, you wanna sell it to your sister for $5, you can, and encoded in that smart contract, I could have a 5% or 1%, whatever royalty that says, yeah, okay, you sold it for $5, that's great. I'm gonna get five cents or 50 cents or whatever, off of that transaction. So I create an ongoing revenue stream for myself as the developer, which I do think is a positive thing. As someone who lived and worked in the music business for a number of years, accounting of royalties and downstream backend payments to original creators is really hard and complicated. I've been on the side of making payments, doing accounting, trying to be transparent with people and make them feel like they're being fairly treated and also receiving payments, receiving accounting, either receiving or not receiving money, you know. So a network that makes royalty payments more standardized, more automatic and more auditable, I think could be a really positive thing in a whole range of applications, right? So I see this as a potential positive application of this technology. So. Hopefully you come out of this with some thoughts that are, that are useful to chew on. I do understand that this probably won't change many people's minds and that's fine. I just thought that it would be worth trying to offer a somewhat two-sided conversation on this subject for the people who haven't engaged deeply. If you're interested in this stuff, I recommend you, you do some research. It's something new. So I think it's worth at the very least being an informed opponent of it or uh, being an informed participant. Being an uninformed opponent or an uninformed participant are both bad, right? So I encourage you to, to get informed if you're at all interested. Drop a like on the video if you liked it. <laughs> Drop a dislike if you didn't. Drop me a comment. Very interested to hear your thoughts and comments on this topic. If you're not already subscribed, please do consider subscribing. And I've put a link to the Level 2 Game Dev newsletter where we share links and information about many different things once a month with no spam ever. So thanks a lot for checking it out and I will see you in the next video. Bye.